Now, I sat down with the author of Plots and Prayers, Nikki Sava, earlier today to talk about her new book. There's a whole, a few books on the leadership coup that are coming out, and Nikki's is the first. She beat everyone else to the punch. Uh, it's a fascinating book. Uh, whether you agree with her insights or not, it's, it's still worth listening to what she has to say after interviewing all the main players. Let's have a listen. Nikki Sava, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. Now, you've got this extraordinary book, Plots and Prayers, out as of yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think what the most fascinating thing for me about the book is just the level of detail, the behind-the-scenes conversations, you know, what was said um, at lunch in a particular restaurant. And I, I think what seems is the, the way you got that sort of access is because you interviewed people along the way, didn't you, as, as the events were unfolding rather than afterwards? Well, I actually began interviewing people for the book the day after the final vote, the day after uh, Malcolm Turnbull was deposed. I began ringing people that day because I wanted to get their recollections while they were still raw. I didn't want people to sort of go back and revisit what they thought or what they felt or, or what they did. And um, I wanted it to be real, you know, I wanted their emotions to be real and um, also their, their recollections. And I gave them undertakings at the time. I said that I would not publish anything until after the election, that nothing would appear in any column or on TV or anything. Whatever they told me would stay for the book, which would not come out until after the election. One, one of the big takeouts from the book that, you know, there's been a lot of focus on this week is the first leadership vote when Turnbull called the spill himself. And you write in it that, um, you know, many people in, in Turnbull's camp came to the conclusion that uh, Morrison supporters voted uh, against Turnbull and that, you know, the, they had, Turnbull had expected the numbers to be in the 20s, but in fact they were in the 30s. It, it, does, does Turnbull himself believe that Scott Morrison uh, let him down or, or betrayed him in that first vote? Well, it, Turnbull uh, did believe that. Uh, Craig Laundy, who was doing numbers for Turnbull, certainly believed. Uh, he said that 10 of Morrison's people voted for Dutton, but it wasn't just Turnbull, it was Dutton also. Dutton told me that he believed that all of Morrison's people voted for him in that first ballot. So does Turnbull feel betrayed by Morrison as a result of this? Well, um, betrayed, uh, whatever, um, you know, that's a, that's a very highly charged word, isn't it? But. Um, Turnbull's first objective uh, was to see that, um, to save himself, and his second objective was to ensure that uh, Dutton didn't triumph. But, but it wasn't, like I say, Dutton always believed that the Morrison people voted for him in that first ballot and that it was a deliberate strategic decision on their part. He is convinced that Bert Van Manum, who, who was part of their group, as deputy whip, knew that there was going to be a ballot on the leadership and that he informed his close colleagues and they were prepared uh, when it happened and that they all voted for him. Did so Morrison he respond feels, to this suggestion? Uh, for your I, book? I put it to him and um, he said, well, you know, as far as I know, um, they all voted for Turnbull. Um, but I said to him, well, that's not true because they have actually admitted a few of them. Lucy Wicks was another. Lucy Wicks and Ben Morton and also Van Manen himself. Ben Morton, of course, travelled with Scott Morrison uh, during the campaign on, on his plane. Uh, and so they're very, very, very close. close. Yeah. Now, you spoke to Matthias Coleman one day before the vote, you write in the book, and he said he would stick with Malcolm Turnbull until the bitter end and that if Turnbull went down, he was going to go down with him. Mm. What changed? <laughs> Well, or, 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 or was he misleading you in, in that statement? Well, was he lying then, or was he lying um, what do you subsequently? Think? What do you think? Well, um, I believed him when he said that because I had spoken to him previously about that very same thing, and he had said the same thing uh, to me months before. 
that he couldn't bear to go through another one of those um, episodes again because of what happened with Abbott. So he said he had discussed it with his wife and they were in agreement that um, if anything happened, he would resign and leave the parliament. Now, um, if you um, look at what Turnbull and his supporters think, they reckon that um, Turnbull um, believed that Dutton was faltering, that he was losing votes after that first ballot. He made a couple Momentum of mistakes. Momentum was falling away. It was falling away. He came out with those policy ideas that were ridiculed. That were ridiculed. The word was going around that he was going to reinstate um, Abbott um, to the Cabinet, which he was denying to people, but they weren't believing. And Dutton was, in fact, losing numbers. And uh, Turnbull's people warned Corman. They said to him, if you persist with this, Morrison will be Prime Minister by the end of the week. Well, I think, didn't you write in the book that uh, Sally Cray actually sent a text message to that effect? To Stephen Chobo. To Stephen Chobo. As well. Yeah. But she had also said the same thing to um, Matthias Corman. Uh, so maybe this fired um, Corman up. He had to make a choice. Did he stay loyal to his Prime Minister or did he look after his friend and he chose his friend? Yeah. Now, another big revelation in the book uh, is that Alex Hawke had been for months uh, keeping the numbers uh, on a laptop at his home if a leadership spill should eventuate. Have, have, did you confirm this? Um, I spoke to dozens and dozens of people, um, obviously, and um, yes, I had that confirmation. Um, he had all the numbers stored in his laptop for months and he would update depending on events. Like everybody knew where people stood on same-sex marriage and how that would be likely to influence their vote if something happened. Um, everybody also knew um, So he wasn't regularly stood. speaking to people to say, if something hypothetically eventuated, who would you support? It wasn't that kind of level of, 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 of doing the numbers. The way it works, uh, the way it was put to me, and Ben Morton was doing some of this as well, is, you know, you go around and talk to your colleagues. How do you think things are going? You know, what do you think would happen if Turnbull fell under a bus? Who do you think would be the best person to step in um, at that point? So you learn to gauge what your colleagues' thinking is, whether they think, you know, the Prime Minister's in trouble, whether they think something might happen, and if it did, which way would you be likely to go? So it's intelligence gathering. Now, there's also a pretty fascinating conversation that you describe uh, between Matthias Corman, Christian Porter and Michael Keenan at a restaurant in Perth in April 2018, where uh, Michael Keenan uses some um, pretty graphic language to describe the now Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. Obviously, we can't say that sort of language on television. But Matthias Corman and Christian Porter were joining in on the criticism. What were their concerns about Scott Morrison then? Uh, they didn't think he was a team player. Uh, Matthias had had a couple of run-ins uh, with Scott Morrison along the way, a couple of shouting matches, and which he didn't take very kindly to, and uh, he pulled Morrison up and told him not to do it again. So they had a fairly testy kind of relationship, but, but the main thing was that they did not think he was a team player. And I think we've seen a little bit of that, um, where uh, Morrison is very much a solo player. He loves being out there, you know, on his own and, and running the show. And the thing that, uh, the point that Keenan was making, apart from, you know, using that graphic language, was to say that when he was Morrison's junior minister, Morrison treated him like a school kid. So he felt very insulted and offended by that. Now, just to um, move on to, you know, th this big potential constitutional crisis that Christian Porter has spoken about in, in some interviews, in including in your book, what was Turnbull's defence about why he had the C1 and also the cop cars uh, ready to escort him to the Governor General? You know, what was his defence for this, for this notion that um, if he wasn't going to win, that he could just go straight and, and call an election on his own side, as I think Simon Birmingham put it? <laughs> 
Well, um, we're going to have to wait for Malcolm's book firstly to find out uh, the nitty gritty um, of but all he, that. He but would have done was, an interview with you for your book, I, I assume. Um, he answered a couple of factual questions, right? Yeah. Um, that was it. But he wasn't going to go through everything because he's saving it um, for himself. Um, but obviously I spoke to people who had dealt with him all the way through that period and he was keeping open every single option, you know, depending on, on what happened. I mean, he was convinced that if Dutton won the ballot, that he would not be eligible to sit in Parliament and he, Turnbull, as the outgoing Prime Minister, was fully prepared to write to the Governor-General and say you cannot commission Dutton yeah. because um, he's not eligible and he was prepared to drive out to Yarralumna and call an election. Just would have been absolutely amazing. Um, now before you go I also want to ask you about the Barnaby Joyce chapter. <laughs> um, which well is, you probably uh, know as much about um, that as me. Well Sherry. not everything <laughs> actually it was of, of huge interest to me the level of detail that you knew but but especially this part really that you you write in it that Sally Cray Malcolm Turnbull's then principal private secretary and, you know, the closest person to him in his office, that she was aware a couple of weeks before Christmas, before Christmas, uh, in two, so that was December 2017, that Barnaby Joyce and Vicky Campion were pregnant. That is amazing because when the story broke, you know, Turnbull came out and said that he was not aware that there was any relationship at all. Well, um... Turnbull and Barnaby had a couple of meetings, right? And uh, before Vicky uh, became pregnant, the stories were around. Uh, there were rumours about an affair. And they had a session together. And Turnbull gave Barnaby every opportunity. And he didn't say anything. And he didn't say anything. Everything was hunky-dory. But then later on, Malcolm asked him directly, was there an affair, you know, was he having an affair with his staffer? And Barnaby denied it. But that was earlier, wasn't it? That was, that was, that was that after was... the budget. But I'm... I'm talking about in December no, 2017, well, because you write that Jake Smith, which was Barnaby Joyce's chief of staff, told Sally Cray, confirmed to her in December 2017 that, that they were pregnant, expecting that Barnaby Joyce was going to tell Turnbull at a and meeting, he and he didn't. And he didn't tell him. But before that, that visit to the surgery... Um, which, which was which was back in April. Which but, but I you guess wrote about. I did, well, no, I didn't write about. I never well, wrote about well, the visit to the surgery. Well, but I was there was another was, meeting then between yes. uh, Turnbull and Joyce, and Turnbull asked him. He said, and he didn't, "You've and he, been seen in you know, surgery," but, but he said, "I accompanied her as a friend." Yes, exactly. She's had a troubled life. But I'm life. talking about later on in December. This was just after the New England by-election and Turnbull had claimed he didn't know anything about it, but in fact Jake Smith had told Sally Cray that they were pregnant. I mean, how can Turnbull not ask Barnaby or Joyce about it then? Well, you know, you, I don't know the answer to that question, yeah. but the reason that Jake told um, Sally Cray, but also told um, other members of Turnbull's staff was because By he Matheson assumed... found out later. He yeah. assumed at that meeting Barnaby was going to tell Malcolm, and he didn't. Amazing. Thank you very much, Nikki. That's a, a very juicy book mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of detail, which is very important for the historical record as well. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure.